All right, so hi, I'm Laura. Um, and I'm going to be showing you some really easy ways that you can improve your designs. Um, but before I do, I just want to start with a really quick story. So about two months ago, my partner decided to build his ultimate gaming machine. So he researched all the best parts he needed, and he went onto Amazon, and he ordered a motherboard, a really expensive GPU, and a case which glowed. And a few days later, he was sat on our tiled bathroom floor trying to piece this thing together. And after about six hours or so, it resembled a computer. Um, and the time came to switch it on and see if it works. So he plugged it in. He pressed the button, and nothing, black screen. And I was there watching, thinking, oh my god, he is going to freak out. All that time and money spent, and it's broken already. But instead, he just kind of shrugged a bit and said, OK, let's fix this. And he got straight back to work mending his machine. And so a little bit later on, I asked him, I said, so why didn't you freak out after all that hard work for nothing to have happened? It must have been so frustrating. And what he said really surprised me. He said, I didn't freak out because I haven't built a gaming machine in over 10 years. I wasn't ever expecting it to work the first time. But I knew that I could debug this. I knew that if the light didn't switch on, it was probably going to be an issue with the power. I knew that if the light switched on but the monitor didn't, it was something to do with the monitor. It was literally just a case of assessing the situation, pinpointing the different issues, and then going through and fixing them one by one until the computer switched on. So I run a website called Design Academy. And my goal with that is to teach developers, like my partner, how to design websites and apps so they don't look like they've been designed by a developer. <laughs> and I've been working really hard to figure out how I can teach something like design to people who are technical, to people who appreciate and enjoy and want good design, but they don't actually want to become designers. And what I realized was, if my partner had been designing a website for six hours, if he'd read books and watched tutorials on color theory and design principles, and then he stood back to admire his work, and it looked like crap, he would have just given up. He'd have thought, this is completely pointless. I just don't get design. I don't have that wacky, creative flair. This is not for me. And so what I came to realize is that design is a little bit like building a gaming machine. So you can read all the right documentation. You can read the manuals. You can watch all the right videos. And it's still probably not going to work the first time. Even for designers like me who've been doing this for almost 10 years, it still just isn't going to look good the first thing you do. And you shouldn't expect it to. Because as with the gaming computer, when it doesn't work the first time, you need to just stand back, identify the where the issues are, and then just go through and fix them one by one, and just keep repeating that until you've got something in front of you that looks good. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So I'm going to take a random website that I found, and I'm going to walk you through the steps that I took to debug it and improve the design. And here are the things that we're going to take a look at. So I'm going to look at the colors. I'm going to look at the fonts. Then we're going to have a look at the hierarchy, so where things are placed and how prominent they are. We're going to look at the layout. And then we're going to look at adding some polish at the end of it. And this is the website we're going to use. Um, and this is one that I just found randomly online. Um, it's from a developer called Michael Kimsel. Um, and I chose it because I think it's a pretty typical representation of a developer's sort of personal website. So it's not too bad, really, but it could definitely be improved. And this is the design that we're going to end up with. So it's still pretty simple. Um, it just looks a little bit more put together. And the important thing to note is that we haven't used any fancy techniques. So it's stuff that everyone in this room should be able to do. There's no illustrations. You don't have to be an artist or anything like that. But I'm just going to show you step by step how I went about debugging this design to get from the one on the left to the one on the right. So the first thing we're going to look at is the color, as color is a pretty big part of a website and a brand and all that stuff. So there are a few things on this website that Michael's done right. 
Firstly, he stuck to a really simple color palette. He hasn't tried to mix loads of different colors into his design. He's got green, white, and gray. And that's going to make life so much easier. And secondly, I actually kind of think he's picked a fairly decent shade. Um, but I really wanted to teach you like a kind of process that you can use to pick colors. Um, if, I, if I wasn't going to do that, I might have actually kept it as it is. Um, but let's, so let's assume that we don't have a color, or we didn't like the color, and we need to find one. Um, so the first thing to do is to just decide on any color that you're going to use for your design. So just pick something, just green, red, blue, pink, purple, whatever. Um, and that's really as detailed as you need to be at this stage. Um, and this color could come from your logo if you have one. Or one thing I like to do if I'm not sure is to just look at my main competitors, see what colors they're using, eliminate those, and then pick something completely different. So if all your competitors are using blue, go for orange or something. So for the purposes of this, let's just use purple as our color. Um, and this is the default purple that comes in Keynote. Um, I'm not really a huge fan of this particular shade, so the next thing we're going to do is try to pick a nice shade of purple. And I don't know about you, but I can pretty much never pick a decent color if I'm using the color picker or if I go onto like color lovers or something and I'm just looking at these colors. Because I find it really hard to tell which shade is going to look good applied to a website. And I always end up picking the wrong one. So instead, what I typically like to do is I like to go to dribble.com forward slash colors. Um, and there, you've just got the option to search the different shots based on a particular color. So we can look at the purple shades, pick one that you kind of like, just click update, and you'll see loads of different shots using colors like this one. And the reason I like this is because you're not just looking at abstract colors. You're looking at colors that are used in real uh, designs. So you've got context. And after scrolling through, I thought this one kind of stood out to me. I liked it. So I just used a Chrome extension called, I think, Color Picker Eyedropper or something. And I just used that to grab the hex code. So we can just apply this straight to the website. So you've gone from this <coughs> to this. And now we've got a completely brand new color. It didn't take that much effort. Again, there was nothing really wrong with the original, um, but I just wanted to show you the way that I use to choose a decent color. And it works pretty much all the time. So now you've got one color. Um, you're probably going to need some others to go with it. Um, but when you're just starting out with a design, I like to try and get away with the least amount of colors as possible. So only add a new color when you absolutely need it, not before, just exactly when you need one. So don't try and create a whole color palette before doing your design. The color palette's going to come out of what you design. So for our website, we've got a pretty nice palette currently. So we've got the purple that we picked out earlier. We've got a lot of white. We've got a dark gray that's used in the text. And we've actually got a lighter gray as well, which um, is used for the button. Um, but there's something slightly wrong with this palette. And the projector, <laughs> projectors, unfortunately, never really show this very well. So I kind of have to take my word for it. Um, the first three colors look pretty good together. But there is something slightly off about that fourth color. And again, if you were seeing it on like, my laptop or something, you'd probably be able to see it better. Um, because if you look closely at those two grays, um, and if you look at the values, you'll see that there's actually a, a lot of blue in that dark gray. And that light one is completely desaturated. So when you actually look at them side by side, it almost looks brown. Um, so really, we should be using a tint or a shade of either one of those grays to form the other palette. So we're going to use, I, I think the darker gray with the blue in kind of matches the purple a little bit better. So I'm going to use a tint of that color for the lighter gray. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to go to a website called paleton.com. Um, I'm just going to put the hex color of that dark gray into the little box in the corner. And it will just show you all the tints and shades that you can use for your color. So all we're going to do is we're going to take that light gray there. And we're going to change our palette. So I don't know how this is going to work, but it's basically gone from this to this, which looks a little bit more harmonious. Um, and you can see it applied here, but really it's not a huge change because it was basically just that button that had it. Um, but at least we've got the start of a nice harmonious <coughs> color palette that we can use elsewhere. So the next thing that I want to look at is the fonts. So the font Michael's used here is called Lato or Lato. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's a really nice font from Google Web Fonts. 
But I don't know about you, but I kind of think on this website it looks a little bit plain. Um, so considering the website is pretty minimal in terms of graphics and colors, um, it's really the typography that's got to be polished. <coughs> so we're going to look for some other fonts that we can use that just adds a little bit more visual interest. And we're going to use Google Web Fonts for this because it's free, the quality is pretty good, um, stuff like that. So it can be a little bit overwhelming when you kind of go to Google Web Fonts and you're just kind of faced with this wall of fonts. Um, but I've got a few tips that can kind of help you when you're sort of searching through. And the first one's kind of a strange one because it kind of goes against what a lot of other people say. But I really find that choosing two typefaces is far easier than just choosing one. And that's because when you're just choosing one typeface, it really needs to be different and kind of quirky enough to make for interesting headings, but it also needs to be readable enough and clear enough for long chunks of body text. And I think that's a really difficult thing for one typeface to do. And the second thing is, if you are going to have more than one font, make sure it's different enough to warrant it. So this is a website. This is Harvest, I think. Um, and those headings are actually completely different typeface to the body text underneath. And I don't know about you, but I'm not really convinced that the extra weight of having a whole new typeface is really worth it in this case. So by far, the easiest way to make sure they're going to be different enough is to just use a serif typeface for the headings, which is the ones with the little flicks on it, and then a sans serif for the body text, or the other way around. And thirdly, this kind of hops back to the first point, but just look for one with character for the headings and just keep the body font really clear and readable. So if we look at our list here, at first glance, I'd probably pick the following um, for headings, as they've got a little bit more character and they really don't look like something I'd want to read in long chunks. The rest are a bit simpler. So in theory, uh, we could pair any of the highlighted fonts with the non-highlighted ones, and there's a chance that they'd work together. But if you want a slightly more foolproof way of picking out fonts than just scrolling through Google Web Fonts, um, there's a really good website uh, by a guy called Hayden Mills where he's just put together different font pairings that you can use with Google Web Fonts. So I'm just going to use this website and see if we can apply one of these combinations to Michael's website. So I'm going to go for a serif heading with a sans serif body text. Um, other way around will work too. It's just kind of personal preference. Um, and here are some of the options that the website showed me. So we just need to go through and eliminate some of them. So because this is a personal website, I don't really want it to look too corporate. I want it to have some kind of personality. So I think these two look a little bit academic, which I'm not really keen on for a developer's website. This one kind of reminds me of like a fashion magazine, which doesn't really seem to fit the bill either. Uh, this one's a maybe. I think it's a serif, but it's not too academic. It's got a little bit of character. This one's just a bit fancy. It's a bit floofy. I just don't think it would work. Um, and again, I like this one also. So it, it's got character, but it doesn't have any weird flicks or swooshes. It just looks kind of big, open, and friendly. So it looks like these two are the kind of the winners. So this is Michael's website with the two different fonts applied. Um, personally, I think Roboto, I'm not really good at pronouncing font names, um, looks a little bit better. It just looks friendlier, more open. It's got a bit more character. So I'm going to run with that one. But when you do this, um, don't feel too disheartened if you don't find something you like first time. Um, just keep trying different combinations until you find something that you can work with. But just because we've picked an, a nice typeface, it doesn't really mean the typography is finished. So we've still got some work to do, um, and we're going to go over that in the next section, which is making sense of hierarchy. So one of the biggest problems with Michael's website is that I don't quite know where to look or what to click on. And I really want to be led around the website. So what does Michael want me to read first? What does he want me to do, and in what order? And there are a few key issues here which we're going to address to kind of sort this hierarchy out. And the first thing is, for me, the navigation is a little bit intense and a little bit cluttered. And I wonder if all these links are really needed in that main navigation. The sidebar also seems to take up a lot of prominence. Um, I really think it's the content on the right that should be the first thing we look at. The headline of hello is pretty unengaging, considering just how prominent it is on the page. 
And I also think some of these headings could use a little bit more differentiation. They look a little bit too similar, aside from a very slight font size change. And finally, that how I help section. Um, it's got equal spacing between the section above and the section below, so it's not really immediately clear which part it belongs to. Um, so if we look at these one by one, the first problem we had was the navigation. So you can see the original on the left and the changes that I've made on the right. Um, so what I did was I removed home because um, the logo links to the home page, and I think it's a pretty well-established pattern by now. Um, I also removed the newsletter as we've got the newsletter call to action on this and all the other pages as well, so I don't think it really needs to be in the main navigation too. Uh, I moved the resume into the about page, um, and then I just added a button uh, around this like triangle web prose thing um, because it's actually a separate website, and I think it needs to be clear that it's a separate website. So when it's in the current navigation in the same style, it just doesn't really make sense. I don't really know what it is. I then just moved the whole thing to the right-hand side to just keep it away from the main logo and just kind of balance it a little bit more. So the next thing I did was I just moved the sidebar to the right of the page, because on the left, it was a little bit too prominent. Um, so contact information is obviously important for a developer's personal website. Um, but because we leave read left to right, um, I really wanted to have the text on the right and then the supporting content, uh, text on the left, sorry, and the supporting content on the right. So my next issue was that hello heading. It wasn't really engaging enough, and I just thought it needed to be a bit more meaty. So if this was actually a real project, I'd have been looking at the copywriting to see if the messaging's relevant. Um, but because we're just focusing on like the visual design at the, in this talk, I'm going to leave it as it is there. And all I did for this was I just took the first sentence from the text underneath and put it in the same style as the heading. And this just gives some people something to read it, and to try and convince them to keep on reading. And I really don't think that Hello on its own really did that. We also had the issue where the headings looked too similar. So similar to the typography, if you're going to have a new <coughs> heading style, just make sure it's different enough to really warrant it. So we can keep the How I Help uh, in the lighter weight and just make those services smaller and bolder to differentiate, to differentiate them. And the last thing that I wanted to change is that I wanted to make the How I Help uh, heading obvious which block of text it belongs to. So in the last version, the spacing between How I Help and the previous paragraph and the next was exactly the same. Um, but when you're designing, it's really important to just group relevant bits of content together. So in the example here, if you look at that middle circle on the right-hand side um, in isolation, it might not really be obvious which text belongs to it. So does it have a label above? Does it have a label below? It's not really that obvious. So just make sure the spacing between the different groups is larger than the spacing between the elements inside those groups. The next thing was the, um, oh, I've kind of gone back a slide. Um, sorry. <laughs> so this is basically the before and after of the hierarchy. Um, it's not really too much to look at right now. And I don't know about you, but I actually think the original looks a bit better. Um, but that's OK, because at least we've started to differentiate some things, which is what we want. We can actually work with this. Um, we've got the basics of being led through a page rather than just looking at something that looks the same. But now we just want to see if we can make that whole thing look a little bit better. So currently, everything just looks really cluttered. Um, so we're going to have a look at the layout. And the process that I usually use to come up with layouts is looking at a mixture of the content blocks that we've got to work with. Um, so we've got the sidebar, we've got the main content and the services boxes, and then looking at other websites with similar content blocks, and then just sketching my own versions in thumbnail form. So the sketches are always really quick, always ugly, I'm not an artist, um, and each one took a maximum of about 10 seconds. Um, but I just find it's a really easy way to, to think about different ways the different blocks of content can be displayed, and it's so much faster than trying anything digitally. So like I said, I usually look at websites I like. Um, the thing on the left is a website called Landbook, which just has really nice landing page uh, websites. Um, and I just take blocks from each and kind of mix and match them to build um, out my layout site. So I basically steal. But for Michael's website, um, we're going to keep the layout pretty simple. So we're not really going to be changing anything too drastically. 
Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make some really small changes that's going to build up to make something look good. So the first thing I did was I really wanted to have a look at the spacing. Um, so to me, the most jarring thing on this page is that big heading. It looks so clustered together, and it just doesn't look right. Um, and if you struggle to just look at typography and know how to size it correctly, um, you can use something called the modular scale, which kind of does the calculations for you. So a modular scale is basically a sequence of numbers that kind of relate to each other in some kind of meaningful way. Um, so in typography, we can use the modular scale to size type in a predefined, visually pleasing way. So if you go to typescale.com, you can see pretty much the default values I use for most web projects. Um, everything here is displayed in M's, but I'm going to be using the equivalent in pixels, both here and in the rest of my talk, just because I find it a little bit easier to explain. So I set a base size of 16 pixels, which is 1M, which is what I use for my body copy. Um, but you can set it larger if you're going for a larger body, body copy size or however you want to set it. And then what Typescale will do is it will just calculate different font sizes based on a predefined scale. Um, I usually kind of keep mine at the default scale because, to be honest, I haven't really taken the time to look at what the different scales are. So an augmented fourth kind of sounds good to me. Um, but then you can just take these values and apply them to restyle the text in the rest of the mockup. So we, for hours, we've gone from this to this, which I think just looks much better. But the next thing I want to look at is these column lengths. So that body text there just looks really uncomfortable to read. So the ideal um, character length for a line is usually between 45 to 75 characters. But if we take that first line of copy on Michael's website, it actually comes out as 109 characters. So really, all we have to do is just reduce that column length to make it fit within that range. Um, so this is what it looks like applied here. And you can see now that first line comes in at 71 characters, which is well within the recommended range. However, now we have this issue of this really awkward looking block of white space. So let's see what we can do here. So if we look at the different chunks that make up the website, we can rearrange them to find something that fits. So we've got the sidebar as one chunk. We've got this content area there. And then we've got the services area. Um, and I'm just going to make these squares to make it a little bit easier to see. So what if we could fit that sidebar into that next column to kind of fill that gap? Well, obviously, the sidebar is a little bit long, so we'd have to reduce that a little bit. So maybe we can move those logos to underneath that main text. Because to be honest, I thought they looked a little bit messy in the vertical line anyway. So here it is with the layout change. Um, but now we have that big space on the right, which looks a bit odd. So all we're going to do is just move the whole thing into the center, which just looks much better. So the next thing that I want to change about the layout is the navigation. So it's just not this like big, bright bar at the top. Um, currently, I just think it stands out way too much. And it just kind of looks a bit separate from the rest of the page. So all I'm going to do is just remove that purple bar, put it on a white background, and then just align it with the rest of the content. So it's starting to look a bit cleaner. Um, but I still think everything just looks a little bit squashed together. So we're going to look at the spacing. So for me, I find spacing, or more accurately, lack of spacing, is probably the biggest issue that I see when I look at most websites. Um, so what I typically like to do is I like to just pick one unit um, and using that as a base to come up with values for the rest of the spacing. Um, so it's kind of like what we were doing earlier with the modular scale. And I usually pick something like maybe 20 pixels, and I'll multiply and divide it um, to come up with different spacing measurements for my designs. So this is the current website, and we can build up the spacing using units based on 20 pixels. So how about we make the 20 pixels our paragraph size? So that opens up the paragraphs a little bit. Now, how about we put 40 pixels, which is 20 times 2, uh, between the heading elements and the text below them? Now let's try 60 pixels between the navigation and the content below, um, and also above that how I help section. Now, if we take away the labels, we're left with something that looks like this. So the spacing just looks a lot more natural, especially when you compare it to what we started with. So 
I think this website is looking quite nice now. Um, it's clean, it's got hierarchy, the layout's a bit clearer, um, and we could potentially leave it like this, um, but I don't really want to do that. So now we're just going to look at the last step of debugging your design, which is just adding a bit of polish. So we're going to have a look at which areas could use something a little bit extra. And this is just where we analyze the design and just try to pick out more things that you're not happy with. Um, usually, I prefer to take a break at this point, preferably sleep on it, and come back with fresh eyes. So let's see what we can find. And my list might be completely different to your list, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so for me, the thing that really sticks out to me is that big purple button taking a, a lot of attention. And I really don't think we should be drawing quite as much attention to it, because it actually goes to a completely different external website. And currently, it seems like it's the most prominent thing on the page. Secondly, I think the page is really white. And I like white, but I just want to see if we can get a little bit more color into it somehow, while still keeping it quite clean and minimal. The next thing is a sidebar. Um, to me, it just looks really messy, and it kind of blends in a little bit with the content on the left. So I want to see if we can separate it a little bit and just clean it up. I also have a bit of an issue with the capitalization being inconsistent. So sometimes it's title case, sometimes it's all lowercase. Really small thing, but it just really bugs me. And I also think this could be a little bit more interesting. It just looks a bit bland and just a bit undesigned. And finally, um, I'm not actually sure if that is the call to action, but if it is, it's just a little bit weak. Um, I don't think it should be in the sidebar, so maybe we can just move it to the end of the page. So let's use that and try and make some changes. So the first thing was the button. Um, it was too prominent, so I kind of changed it to a ghost button. Now, I don't usually like ghost buttons that much, but I think we need to make it clear that it's a separate website uh, separate from the rest of the navigation, but without giving too much prominence to it. So in this case, actually, a ghost button is kind of a nice compromise. I also thought the page could do with a little bit of color. Um, so I made the main headline purple. I also toyed with a few other things, like making the logo purple, but I just thought this kind of looked the nicest. Um, <laughs> the next thing was that sidebar. It looked really messy, and it wasn't really separate enough from the rest of the content. Um, and this was actually a big change that I made, so I'm going to talk about all the small parts that made it up in more detail. So the first thing that I did was I just put a really, really light gray box around the sidebar. Um, and I made it very light gray because I don't want it to actually stand out too much. I just wanted it to look like it was separate. <coughs> then I gave the section of the content into info a header saying how to contact me. I put his email address and phone number in a paragraph underneath. Um, which just kind of differentiated it a little bit from the social links. So you could tell there was a difference there. Um, everything aside from the photo just became left aligned, stops those raggedy edges and makes it look neater. Um, and then I just added underlines to the links so they looked a bit more clickable and just went to Font Awesome to find these small icons that I could just put next to the social links. And that was it. So the sidebar had a lot of small changes, but added up, I think it makes a pretty big difference. So the whole thing just looks so much neater and just more professional. The next thing that was that capitalization that really bugged me. So I, pretty easy fix, just changed everything in the content section to be sentence case. But I did decide to leave the logo in lowercase, and I actually changed the navigation to be lowercase too. Um, and this kind of gives it the effect that I think Michael was going for and having lowercase be more of a stylistic choice, but it doesn't really compromise on the overall readability of the content. So it's a small change, but makes a pretty big difference. And the next thing was that how I help section. I really wanted it to stand out on its own a bit more. So the services are pretty important, um, and it just kind of looked a bit bland like this. So again, this was another really big change visually, but the steps that I used are pretty simple. Um, so I wanted the section, I wanted this to look like a section in its own right. So I added another background, the same light gray as the one behind the content box. Um, I just put each service into a white box with a small one pixel border around it, which was a slightly darker color than the background, really small change, probably not that noticeable, um, just adds that really little bit extra polish. Um, and because this is now a full width section, it's differentiated with the background color, I could kind of get away with centering the headline um, and the subheading without it looking too odd. 
Um, and this just makes it look more like a headline. Um, and again, I shorten that line length of the subheading to make it more readable and fit within that line length um, scale. Um, small thing, but I just put a small faint divider line between that and the boxes. Again, it does not really need it, but it just added that little bit extra polish. So the last change that I wanted to make was with the call to action. And I wanted this to really stand out a lot. So again, another seemingly big change, but it uses a lot of the same principles of that how I help section. So I changed the background color, um, this time to be our brand color, which is purple, because when it's a call to action, it's really allowed to just stand out and be kind of bright. Um, it got made full width instead of kind of tacked onto that sidebar, which meant that, again, like the How I Help section, I could center the heading and the subheading again. Um, then I just made the email field longer, because now it's full width, it can be longer, because email addresses are long. And then I just added a button to the right of it. Um, and the button is attached to the input rather than separate, which just makes it, the whole thing look like more like one component than two. Um, and finally, I changed the button color to a darker purple. So if you ever find that you do need a new color and you're not quite sure what to do or you're not too confident with colors, the easiest thing, like we kind of mentioned at the start, is to just use a tint or a shade of that original color that it's on. So again, I found this color by just going back to Palaton, keying in that base color that we used. And again, you'll just see a list of tints and shades for this. Now, I actually wanted something darker, so I just clicked on presets, and I found the darker version there for the button. So now the call to action, start out, call to action stands out a little bit more. We've polished up the website, and to me, I think we're just about done. So this is the final design that we've come up with, and we've come a pretty long way from what we started with. And in reality, we could probably just keep going over and over again, tweaking it and amending it until it's even better. And that's really all there is to design, just analyzing what's wrong, amending it, and learning from it. And over time, you'll be able to make less amends, and you'll do that thing that designers seem so natural at, which is you'll be able to look at someone's design, instantly be able to identify the problem areas and fix them. And it just gets easier the more and more you do it. So before we finish, um, I just wanted to let you know that I'm currently writing a book on the subject of debugging design. Um, if any of you are interested and you want to know when it's released, you can sign up um, at debuggingdesign.co. Just put in your email address, and I'll let you know when it's released. Um, but I really hope this talk has been helpful. So the steps taken to debug the design were really important. But really, what's more important is just knowing that design isn't something that just a select few people can do. Just like when my partner was building his gaming machine, he knew it was never going to work the first time. But he just kept at it until the light switched on and he was playing like Mass Effect or something. So don't beat yourself up if you create something that doesn't really look right. Just use some of the tactics that I shared here and you will definitely see improvements. Thank you.